Hey, so now we're going to start chapters two and three. And these chapters have to do with chemistry, which I know is everyone's favorite. Um, I definitely had issues with chemistry. It was a tough thing for me to understand. So hopefully I can break it down in a way where you can understand it, because I definitely needed a professor to really break it down for me to get it. Um, so chemistry, the reason that we care about it is because biological systems are going to be based on chemistry and the way that proteins fold and the way that your um, blood moves and the way your kidneys work is all based on atoms and how they actually interact. So matter is going to be composed of atoms and matter we can define as anything that has mass and takes up space. So living organisms, which is what we're going to be concerned about in biology, the science of life, those are composed of matter, and therefore they're made of atoms. So if we're going to talk about the parts of an atom, I can scroll down here, and you can actually see this picture here, which is a great picture of an atom. So on a quiz or a test, if I ever ask you to draw an atom, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Okay. The only thing that might be different is you want to make sure that whatever element we're talking about, that you put the right number of the parts in there. But this is what I'm looking for. Okay, so let's look at this a little more closely. So we've got the nucleus of the atom, which is the center. And in the nucleus is where you're going to find the protons and the neutrons. Protons have a positive charge, and neutrons have a neutral charge. Then, going along the outside here is where you're going to find the electrons, and the electrons are going to have a negative charge. So the electrons are going to be found in what's called an orbital, which is kind of the path that they go around the nucleus, and there are a, a whole bunch of orbitals. So this is just showing one, but there could be another one outside of here, and so on. And when we get into the electrons part, we'll get more in detail about that. Now, one thing I want you to notice about this atom here, which is helium, is that you've got two pluses and two minuses. So what would the overall charge of this atom be? Hopefully you're thinking to yourself that it would be neutral and that's because the pluses are canceling out the minuses. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to live in our happy little world where everything follows the rules and does what it's supposed to and that's going to be our periodic table. And so right now this is what helium would look like on our periodic table. Okay, now things are going to change, but I find that it's easier to stay in our happy space and learn how things should work and then learn the different things later. Okay, so that's how, kind of how we're going to go with this. All right, so let's talk about the periodic table in a little more detail. So hopefully you have your periodic tables that either I gave you or you printed out from the class website. And this is what it should look like. And this is a great periodic table because it doesn't have a bunch of extra stuff that we don't need. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on this hydrogen in the upper left corner here um, because I want to show you a couple of different things about it. And you can do one of two things. You can either keep this here and just draw lines to label these different parts, or you can draw a little legend here and recreate that and label that there, whatever makes you happy. So first thing that I want you to look at is this whole number here at the top. And another thing is that notice all these other boxes have the exact same setup. So this is kind of a little legend for all of them, okay? So you've got this top number here, and that's always going to be a whole number, and that's called the atomic number. Um, just below that, you're going to have the H here, and that's going to be the symbol for the element. Further down, you're going to have the name of the element, and then finally, you're going to have the atomic mass. So you may want to label those atomic number, symbol, name of the element, and then atomic mass. Now an important thing about the atomic mass is we're always going to round it. So you can see for hydrogen we'd round it to one, but here for lithium we would probably round that to seven. Beryllium we would round it to nine. Okay, So that's going to come up a little bit later. So those are all the different parts that you're going to find in the periodic table. Now let's talk about the atomic number in a little more detail. So this number is going to tell us how many protons and how many electrons are found in that element. Okay? And that makes sense that it, they should be equal because we want them to cancel out. A lot of chemistry is trying to actually find that neutral spot. Okay? So that's what we've got right here. Now down here is going to be the atomic mass and the atomic mass is going to be the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Okay? So let's go through a couple of these and see if we can figure it out. We're going to start out pretty easily. I could ask you for magnesium right here, 
how many protons does it have? And you would say 12, right? How many electrons does magnesium have? 12. Let's go to lithium. How many protons does lithium have? Three. How many electrons does lithium have? Three. Hopefully you're noting a little bit of a trend here, right? So that's kind of how um, you're going to figure out protons and electrons. Now, down here, this number I said was going to tell you the amount of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if I asked you to figure out how many neutrons an atom has, it gets a little tougher, right? But all you have to do is think about the fact that this number here, let's, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's go to something you're a little bit, you're going to use a lot in this class. Let's do carbon. So carbon is going to have an atomic number of six, and that means it has six protons and it has six electrons. Now to find out the neutrons, all we have to do is subtract these two numbers. So 12 minus 6 gives us 6, which means it has 6 neutrons. Great. Let's move over to nitrogen. That's another one that we're going to use a lot. So nitrogen has 7 protons, 7 electrons, and then if we try to figure out the neutrons, 14 minus 7 gives us 7. Now this might make your mind make a pattern that says, oh, well, okay, so it's always the same. So if it has six protons and six electrons, it's going to have six neutrons. Not necessarily true. Let's look right over here at boron. So boron has five protons and five electrons. But then if we round this to 11 and subtract, it actually has six neutrons. And if we go back over here to lithium, right, lithium has three protons and three electrons, but if we find out the neutrons, we do seven minus three, it actually has four neutrons. So you definitely want to make sure you do that math to figure out neutrons. Don't just assume it's going to be the same as the atomic number because it's not all the time. All right. So um, atomic mass, when we say that, we really need to make sure that we differentiate between mass and weight. Mass is talking about the amount of a substance, and then weight is going to be the force that is being put on that substance by gravity. So if we were to get in a spaceship and go up into space, we would say that our weight has changed. We've gotten lighter, but our mass has stayed the same. Okay, so that's an important thing to differentiate. So when we talk about atomic mass and we say it's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, it's looking at how much is in that substance. Now, another thing that's important about atomic mass is that it is going to be measured in what are called Daltons. So a proton is going to have the mass of one Dalton, and a neutron is going to have a mass of a Dalton. However, electrons are super small. If you look at this, their mass is 1, 1,840th the size of a proton. So they're super tiny, super tiny. And to give you an idea of how big a Dalton is, you remember in your lab about the metric system, you probably weighed a paper clip to figure out that that was a couple of grams. One gram has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd Daltons in it, which is a lot, right? So you can imagine how teeny, teeny, tiny these things are. Okay. Now, another thing important um, about the parts of an atom is going to be when it turns into an isotope. An isotope is going to be an atom that all of a sudden has a different number of neutrons. So going back here, let's say, um, let's look at beryllium. And beryllium has how many neutrons? Hopefully you came up with five. And so let's say that we find beryllium that has four neutrons. We would say the one that has four neutrons is an isotope because it has a different number of neutrons. The important thing is it's still beryllium, and the way that we know it is is because the atomic number hasn't changed. The amount of protons has not changed, okay? So why do we care about isotopes? Well, we use radioactive isotopes a lot. And when we say radioactive, that means that they're decaying and they give off radioactive particles as they do that. And one that we use a lot is carbon. And we use that for what's called carbon dating. So let's say you found a fossil and you wanted to figure out how old it was and you came up with 4 million years old. Well, you'd have to do a calculation to figure that out. So we know how long it takes carbon to decay, and that's called its half-life. That's the time it takes for half of the atoms in a sample to decay. And for carbon-14, which is an isotope, it takes 5,730 years. So then what we can do is we can actually plug in how much of each isotope is present into a calculation, and then it will tell us how old something is. 
So that's going to be how isotopes work. Now in the next video, we're going to talk about electrons and how electrons are going to work and cause things to react with one another.